I'd like to first call up my good friend and uh, president of Framingham State University, Javier Savalas. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this beautiful place that we have. I have a Google technology, I don't know what I did. That we have thanks to Senator to Spielka. That's uh, the, the work I wish I could announce all of you here. I saw some. 
uh, town managers, as town administrators, parents, schools, principals. If I did, we'd take another 10 minutes, but it really is great to have you all here, and I want to thank you so much. Uh, I do just want to mention that we are uh, blessed. We have uh, Maria Mercedes here. I'd like to acknowledge Maria. She is the Massachusetts Child Advocate, so if there are issues concerning children, Maria and her staff are smack in the middle of it all, doing a great job investigating and helping drive policy, good public policy, so thank you. And I do just want to take a moment to introduce uh, Brian Prescott, a Hopkinton uh, High School history teacher who actually interned in my office on his time off. That's what he did as his break. Um, and it was great having him, and we keep in touch. And he's here with Megan, Tara, Luke, and Young, who are Hopkinton High School student government students here to learn. So uh, hopefully, you know, you may learn from them as well. So I just want to say my goal, I have a Metro West Kids initiative that's been ongoing for the last uh, two years or so. And the whole idea is to identify strategies to help all of our children across Metro West. What can we do to help raise uh, healthy, strategic, resilient kids in, in, our, in our Metro West and beyond? Um, you know, we do it through school, we do it in families and parenting, we do it in community groups, and it really does, to use the phrase, take a village, take a community to do this. So uh, we are trying in my office to provide resources and tools to parents, to school committees, to principals and superintendents, and whoever else might be uh, interested to help share the resources, the experts, when you may not know exactly who to go to, and help provide some of these strategies and tools, and then decide if this is the beginning of a foundation that maybe, particularly in the schools, uh, you might want to pull on and grow and implement more and develop particularly with this, a social and emotional learning curriculum. We, we all know that the schools these days, and I will say it, you know, focuses on academia so much, and they should. We want our kids to learn and to be uh, able to be self-sustaining and support themselves, but there is because of, I believe anyway, because of the push and the emphasis on testing and making sure that kids do well with the tests, we have gone away from the social and emotional learning aspect of school. I had a long talk with somebody today about recess and how we've gone away from recess. And I swear, having recess in my elementary school helped me be state senator. I learned collaboration, negotiation. I learned to back off a little bit. Um, you know, I used to play with a lot of the boys in, in, in elementary school. So I'd be out there in the softball team and learning how to interact and um, you know just so many of the skills that you learn with recess. You also let off steam and we have such a big you know, obesity epidemic in our, with our kids now for so many reasons. But these are things, whether we do it or not, I think it's really important to have a discussion and, and debate and uh, be much more aware of some of these issues because you know it's so much it's just as important I believe as the academic aspect of school. So I am going to um, cut to uh, you know we'll, we'll um, hear not only from the Rennie Center and uh, uh, Jennifer Poulos, the associate director. We have um, about the ex ex excellence through social and emotional learning coalition we'll learn about, which is a network that brings together school districts across Massachusetts to design and implement uh, programs to promote cell, social and emotional learning. We have Deborah Brom Bromfield, Director of Student Services, Canton Public Schools. Thank you for coming. Uh, at least there's no snow tonight. Last year there was. Rachel Engler Bennett, Associate Commissioner, Student and Family Support. Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and Richard Fournier, uh, Director of District Partnerships in Transforming 
education. I look forward to hearing from all of, all of these folks. I look forward to hearing, hopefully, this time for question and answers as well. Um, and let us know that Nino, you know, that Pooja, Pooja, do you want to stand up? Who really organized it. She's the one that should get the round of applause. Um, thank you. Let us know if there's something more or different that we can help all of you do and provide. That's really important. Look to us as a resource. Whatever we can do, we can look into and find uh, what, what we need to or who we need to to help make your jobs hopefully a little bit easier. So thank you again for coming. Uh, I'd like to invite you all up. Um, turn it over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Senator Spoken, for the invitation for tonight, the wonderful welcome. Um, we are, have a number of just overview remarks um, that will talk a little bit about research that the Ready Center has done on the social emotional learning issue. And then we're going to quickly move into a panel of my esteemed colleagues here representing the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Transform Ed, and Kansas Public Schools. So just um, um, before we begin some of the content, uh, just a note on the Rennie Center. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent think tank. Uh, our founder, former Secretary of Education Paul Revel, uh, founded us with the mission of providing better evidence on work that schools and districts across the Commonwealth are taking on to put that in the hands of policymakers to improve decision making student learning. We have a history of really attacking issues of student learning, often defined by college and career readiness, and that's actually where our interest in socio-emotional learning came from. All of our numbers, studies that focused on how to reduce the dropout rate, how to increase the students and students of all communities obtaining a Massachusetts public high school diploma, and what kinds of alternative education practices were out there. We heard time and time again from educators across the Commonwealth, we got the academics, it's the social and the emotional that we need help with. So after we had done probably the fifth report on, on what it takes to not only get past the goalpost of a high school diploma, but enroll in college and persist, we sort of took on this issue headlong. So why socio-emotional learning? And I know many of you attended the event last year so, uh, and are very passionate about this issue. The, and we'll hear this, uh, these sentiments echo for many of our panels tonight. The notion is that social-emotional learning, well, all learning is both social and emotional in nature. It, it, it really grounds academic learning to be able to speak to the way that students learn in exercising the full cognitive range of abilities that a student has in the classroom. So the notion that we can just do academic learning or that we can just and do it without speaking to that child's social and emotional functioning processes may actually just be siloing that student's abilities. We know that these skills come with a lot of different names, whether it be soft skills, 21st century skills, career ready skills, they're probably the same range of interpersonal and intrapersonal skills that the Kessel framework, which is I know familiar to many of you who joined us last year, really seek to capture. The notion that things like relationship building, social awareness, self-awareness, really define how we learn about how we learn, um, and how even our youngest students can develop the kind of skills that make them not only better in the classroom, better to manage their own stress, better able to respond to emotional and behavioral triggers, and be more successful. It was going to happen to me too. Through their academic career as they approach college and make, start to make career decisions. Um, the notion here is that much of our research about socio-emotional learning is grounded in this castle framework and these five sets of skills. You'll hear different interpretations of these skills tonight. Um, so I call your attention to this now and challenge you to think about, again, how we'll sort of integrate this in our comments as we begin our panel. So one reflection before we jump into some of the research findings that we have from a national report that we conducted about three years ago is this notion of how to integrate socio-emotional learning. 
And uh, this is actually from one of the national leads that spoke to us at length about why socio-emotional learning is important and that it's going to be a free lead and a framework for our work tonight. Socio-emotional learning isn't something else on the plate. It isn't some new initiative. It isn't some new directive. It isn't some, it is not going to turn into a new accountability mechanism or framework. This is our plate. Once you get the plate established, everything else flourishes. But it also brings up a really interesting question. How do we make it flourish in our districts, in our schools, in our classrooms across the Commonwealth? So the research that the Rennie Center conducted in 2015 was a national scan of how state policy has operationalized around socio-emotional learning in pretty much every other state besides Massachusetts. Some have different approaches like state standards. Some approach it differently through putting it into packaging it with academics. Some have separate strands on like character education that address socio-emotional learning. What we really zeroed in on is try to, in the essence of trying to give advice to practitioners across the Commonwealth, how would you do social-emotional learning if you were sort of starting from scratch? Not many places, not many communities across the Commonwealth are, but what would you do to really sort of build a socio-emotional learning approach? And we'll, again, we'll hear a lot about that from our panels. So we really sort of have four key steps. First, Socio-emotional learning needs to be prioritized and needs to be prioritized at the leadership level. Um, given this notion that all learning is socio-emotional, we need to think about where to integrate socio-emotional learning in the traditional notion of the academic production function. Can we have it in our classrooms? Why and why not? Um, how does it sort of get integrated into important documents like a district strategic plan um, and important notions of the superintendent's priorities and goals. And when we were doing this research in 2015, this was not necessarily to the leadership level it is now. Um, and we will continue to sort of highlight how it continue to grow. Next, like all student learning needs, there are a set of resources in each district that need to be tagged to social emotional learning to really sort of make it thrive. So ingredients matter, whether that be professional development, whether that be additional budget resources, whether that be staffing, uh, whether that be instructional materials like a curriculum, like additional classroom materials that get distributed, whether that be just the nuts and bolts of how to run a classroom need to be considered when we think about the integration of socio-emotional learning into a classroom. Um, some of the districts across the country are thinking about how to fund socio-emotional learning from a district operating line. Some are funding it from grant funds. The notion here isn't that the, where the resources come from matter, it's just that the cornucopia of resources that it takes to integrate socio-emotional learning do need to get addressed. Again, whether it's in a professional development plan, whether it's in a staffing plan, whether it requires additional expertise that some of the, whether it be members of your district or members of community can bring to bear. Next, um, integration. And we've said a little bit about this already, but let me say a few words more. So the notion that socio-emotional learning exists as a different column in a spreadsheet is not a strategy for success. The notion that, it, again, skills like self-management, social awareness, and relationship building can be conducted within an academic activity are, is more of the cutting edge kind of implementation that is beginning to evolve as we all bring more expertise and passion to this issue. And I know that I'm going to pause here because I know my colleague Richard Fournay from Transformat is going to speak to this specifically, but just thinking about how a writer's workshop activity in a kindergarten classroom, a science experiment in a sixth grade lab, or a writing assignment in a 10th grade English literature class may actually focus on those five skill dimensions that I brought up as part of the castle dimensions as much as it can on academic skills. So that writer's workshop in kindergarten may focus on some 
elements of self-awareness. Like, what kind of storyteller am I when I talk about this particular narrative that I'm writing? In that sixth grade experiment, it might be about the relationship building that is done as we explore some inquiry methods around a chemistry experiment. I can go on and on with these examples, but the notion really is how do you sort of blur that line uh, between the academic and the socio-emotional, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that the Excel districts are doing in this in this same regard. And then finally, measure and evaluate. You knew this slide was going to be in here somewhere, right? So the notion that uh, the notion we need to determine which skills matter, and then develop ways to monitor and track, monitor and track them in ways that speak about student growth. So. Don't get us wrong, we know that a sort of the notion that what gets measured is what matters and that often points us very in a very straight line of fashion to some student performance data. That's not totally the message here. The message here is just as we want to grow academic skills, we want to grow our students' socio-emotional learning skills, and knowing what to grow comes from analyzing data on what skill as and capacity students already have, what they're getting better at, and what they need, may need to continue to have help with. So, the, so again, a lot of measurement techniques are going to get talked about across our panel today, but the notion is we are all much better in the education sector about working with data than we were 5 to 10 or even 15 years ago. How do we think about the kinds of data that tell us about whether students are better self-managers than they were maybe a semester ago? And <coughs> use that as part of the ways we think about their performance and growth in schools. Um, so as we move forward, um, just a, this is maybe Throwback Tuesday. So we released this report in November of 2015. It means we did most of our research for the report during the 13-14 and 14-15 school year. At that time, we focused on three districts who were really sort of jumping in with two feet on this issue of socio-emotional learning. So just a quick tour around Massachusetts um, to sort of talk about some of the strategies that these districts were using at that time that may refresh your practice or really sort of uh, present some innovative ideas about socio-emotional learning. So first, in Fall River, Massachusetts, they had received a state grant to really focus on wraparound support, specifically in the early ed sector. They had used a lot of this focus to redefine school readiness as a function of both literacy, math, uh, and also socio-emotional learning skill capacity. So the notion that that socio-emotional learning definition would be incorporated into the school readiness definition, and really started to work as a community coalition to spread knowledge about what it means to be school ready um, in the socio-emotional learning convention. Moving to ready, they have a community-wide coalition that has been really focused on substance abuse issues and, and some of the outgrowth of the opioid crisis in the community. That community coalition made sure that top of their partner list was ready public schools and how to think about the kinds of supports that can be shared between a community-wide coalition largely focusing on substance abuse and the kinds of skills and capacities that might be really great to have in schools that might be preventative and also trauma-facing at the same time. So sort of wrapping that community coalition around the public schools. And then finally, Gardner Mass, who focused on this from a professional development angle. Thinking here that educators, who are our first line responders in some ways, um, to the trauma that is part of some of the culture of our schools, we need to be taking care of our educators as well, and sort of thinking about some of the, the kinds of ways that the socio-emotional competency of educators can be attended to as we think through the socio-emotional learning competence of our students. So training teachers to train other teachers at working, again, as building level teams on issues of socio-emotional learning and, again, building community capacity in that school building for socio-emotional learning and knowledge. So where do we go from here? Well, um, this, again, 
report released in November of 2015. It caught the eye of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents and School Committees, as well as the Massachusetts School Administrators Association. And they asked the Remy Center, uh, along with our uh, trusted partner, Transform Ed, to sort of think through how to work with Massachusetts districts on some of the kinds of socio-emotional learning needs that they have. From that partnership of the two organizations and the associations, we've since formed the Excel Network, which through a competitive application process identified nine districts stretching from North Shore, Boxford, Topsfield, out west to Fitchburg, down south to Brockton, and all the way to the Char Chatham and Harwich on the Cape. So a very big diversity of districts that all committed to working on issues of classroom level integration for socio-emotional learning. Thinking through the notion that, I might have uh, skipped here just a little bit, that an expanded <coughs> definition of student success a shift in instructional practices and culture combined with the training tools and data needed would really sort of transform socio-emotional learning into a, a key tool for ensuring student success in school and their ability to be college and career ready. We are focusing, and you'll hear a lot about this work from both Richard and our colleague Deb Bromfield from Canton Public Schools, on the notion that in any given case, social emotional learning approaches can inform trauma, they can inform <coughs> culture and climate of a school, and they can also, again, influence classroom level instruction as we sort of pay particular attention to these intrapersonal and interpersonal skills. Our desire with the Excel network is to really sort of focus on SEL skills in the classroom. How do you, again, continue to blur that line between what is the academic and what is the social and emotional? Um, so we are working with these nine districts throughout this current academic school year to help them work on a SEL integration plan. And one more time, Deb Bronfield joining us from Canton tonight will sort of talk through some of the work that the network is doing vis-a-vis -vis some of their priorities. Um, I'd like to sort of pause here actually to move to our panel and invite them to the table where we'll sort of start a more robust discussion of some of the socio-emotional learning strategies and priorities from each of their organizations. But any, uh, maybe I can take a few questions just on any of the content that we presented here as our, as our panelists transition to the table. Any questions before we begin our panel? Okay, I think I'm just going to do a quick round of introductions of our panelists. And um, let's begin a conversation about socio emotional learning priorities. Thank you. So before I sit, I'm just going to introduce our panelists because it's going to be easier for me to do that before I sit down. So to my immediate left is Richard Fournay. He's the Director of District Partnerships for Transform Ed, an organization headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts that is focused on socio-emotional learning mindsets, habits, um, and growth. And he's going to talk a little bit about some of their nationally facing work. To his left is Rochelle Angler-Bennett, who is an Associate Commissioner of Student Support, did I get that right? Students and Family Support at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. She also co-chairs the state's Safe and Supportive Schools Commission. Thank you. And to her left um, is Deb Bromfield, who is the Director of Student Support for the Canton Public Schools. Um, and we, I will be sort of posing a set of questions to each of them, but um, we'll quickly move through that and open up a round of question and answer for the audience as well. So thank you. So Rochelle, I'd love to start with you this evening and hear a little bit about uh, your perspective uh, as a member of the department. What are some of the greatest needs and challenges facing students that you hear about um, from, from 
educators across the state, what are some of the ways that the department has begun to think about priorities that align with these? It's a big question, but I know you're ready to jump in. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having us all and having this event. Uh, and thank you, Senator Kirk, for all your views. The Department of Development and Secondary Education um, has heard from quite a number in the field over the years and has been self reflective as well. And we've heard um, some of what um, you, you've already heard tonight in terms of needs related to students who have. Um, experienced trauma, students who have been um, battling anxiety and depression, and then the daily needs of students to be successful in terms of schoolwork, in terms of navigating um, social relationships with peers, with adults at school, with family members and others, and then in terms of skills um, to be able to be successful in the workplace, um, as well as civic participation, and ultimately, um, in terms of the K-8 system, being able to prepare to be successful in post-secondary education. So we've, um, just one, one data point is uh, through our Youth First Behavior Survey, we um, had, for high school students, uh, approximately one quarter of these students report that they had uh, you know, been, uh, uh, felt sad or hopeless for more than two weeks. Um, and, and that was, you know, that's just one data point with many where there's uh, quite a number of students who are struggling uh, and facing many barriers to learning as well as just the daily skills we all need to be successful. So the department has uh, been listening and reflecting and also considering what Senator Spilka mentioned uh, in terms of hearing from the field of interest in, in, a, in greater emphasis from the department um, in this room. So um, we have been refining our strategic priorities and have identified supporting social and emotional learning, health and safety as one of our five core strategies. And we have um, social and emotional learning as one of the core areas of focus. Um, we have um, taken on a number of initiatives specifically related to supporting social and emotional learning. I won't go into great detail, but I'll mention that um, we have engaged um, with the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. Uh, those of you who were here last year, heard from Ruth Cross from that organization, they have a Collaborative States Initiative, so we've been participating with that. And as part of that initiative, we have undertaken a few specific projects, like updating our guidelines on implementing social emotional learning. Um, we included guiding principles on social emotional learning and our revised mathematics and ELA curriculum frameworks. Um, we've also taken the approach to integrate and align throughout many initiatives support for social emotional learning. I'm happy to go through more examples, but uh, I'll pause there. Great. Great, thank you very much. So I'm going to move to Deb Romfield from Kent Public Schools next. Deb, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your district and the district's priority, how it's placed a priority on social emotional learning. Um, we know that you are just from getting to know you as part of the Excel network, that you've articulated some specific and <coughs> both student and educator learning goals for SEL. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that work and some of its roots. Our roots have been, thank you all for having us here today. <coughs> Eight years ago, we identified that student attendance and student behavior were areas of need of our attention. And as we paid attention to, um, to student attendance, we discovered that students' avoidance of school was multifaceted. Issues included, but were not limited to, bullying, anxiety, poor social skills, lack of self-esteem, mental health, truancy, and academic challenges. And as we began to address each of these issues, we determined that our work would need to be social emotional learning and so began our work in this direction and we progressed over the past eight years. Great. Um, so we're going to go to Richard Cornet next. So you bring up interesting vantage points in tonight's conversation, sort of working nationally on issues of socio-emotional learning outside the Commonwealth with 
some leader districts and states that have really sort of sought out a focus on um, this issue, both from an implementation perspective, but a measurement one, too. Um, so what do you think is some of the most interesting work being done in districts, again, across the country, um, to advance SEL as a priority? Um, that's a good question. I, there's so much stuff, there's so much around this year going on around, uh, from the U.S. <clears throat> the, the efforts I'd probably point to as the most interesting uh, are with the core districts in California. My organization uh, started working with the core districts back in 2013, and basically around that time, <clears throat> uh, six or so superintendents in California from very large urban districts. So we're talking about Los Angeles, San Francisco, Fresno, Santa Ana, Oakland, uh, and a few others. These superintendents got together and basically said, look, we, we want to expand the definition of student success to include social and emotional skills along with uh, many other items as well, um, but more emphasis on culture and climate. Um, so they together, uh, along with our help and a couple other organizations, uh, curated a set of, set of measures around a prioritized set of SEL competencies. Uh, and those were growth mindset, self-efficacy, uh, self-management, and social awareness. And so what they decided to do is they, they felt first we need to collect data on this and see where we're at. And so they created an index, which is really interesting. Uh, the index, which uh, is based primarily on um, academic and then behavior measures. And so the index itself is made up about 60% academic, uh, measures and then 40% everything else. And everything else includes all the kind of behavioral indicators you would expect, culture climate data, and SEL, those SEL measures I mentioned. Uh, and that makes up about, the SEL makes up about 3%. So we worked with them throughout the years to uh, curate a set of measures, working with Bill Harrington and Angel Duckworth, Trump Dweck, these names I'm sure you've heard, uh, validated this with around 450,000 students. Today, uh, they're using this index with around a million students. Now, the reason I mention this as some background context is that the most, what's, that's not so much the most interesting part. What's interesting is that you now have all these, these nine or so districts with all this data. So the big, the interesting part is what are they doing with the data? And what's, what I found fascinating is that, for the most part, the districts have gone off and then done their own uh, innovative uh, efforts around SEL. So, for example, in Santa Ana, they've created a number of online professional development for their teachers around building knowledge around practice and research based competencies. In Fresno, they've created an internal SEL institute for their staff. Um, and the one, I, I'll just be brief, but the biggest, most impressive one, in my opinion, um, has been in San Francisco. Uh, and we worked with them a little bit in developing this. Um, but San Francisco, which is around 46,000 students, I believe, uh, created recently and then rolled out a SEL report card for PK to 5. And so in this report card, the teachers provide proficiency ratings on students in those four areas I mentioned, growth mindset, self-efficacy, self-management, social awareness, which are also part of their standards. And we could debate, of course, whether or not this is a good move, right? Teachers rating students, uh, that, that's a whole other discussion. But the, what, what's really impressive about this is that that one major effort led to a number of impactful things. So, for example, they successfully then created a common language throughout the district. They made it very clear what was being prioritized with SEL. In the process of developing the report card, they involved a variety of parent groups throughout the uh, district who, in turn, asked for a family companion guide translated in six different languages. Uh, they they uh, Include around 140 teachers to review these things. So they got a lot of district buy-in in the process. And the last thing I'd say is that um, this has led to a number of different professional development opportunities, and they're also starting now to see changes in practice. So whether we disagree or, or whatever with the actual rating aspect, the fact that they put together this report card uh, culminated in all of these interesting, impactful uh, uh, impacts. So uh, I, I, in terms of national efforts, I think this is one of, for me, one of those. Great, thanks for the very comprehensive example. So, Michelle, back to you for a sec, if you don't mind me posing yet another question. So when you hear about examples like this from San Francisco, um, what are you thinking about in terms, 
when you think about the, some of the most important ways that the ESE is currently working with districts to help districts shape their socio-emotional learning agenda. Like, in other words, ESE has been out front and shaping a priority for, for it, the agency, but sort of what's the translation function to district-facing work? Sure. So, I mean, I would say that uh, a few things. One, in terms of our agency focus as well, our aim is, is not just about what we're doing, but it's about how we're helping to promote systems and strategies that are creating safe, positive, healthy, culturally competent, and inclusive learning environments that address the varied needs of students um, and improve education levels for all. So some of the ways that we're working with districts include um, through our rethinking discipline professional learning network. We also, we, we also have um, a number of grant programs that support some work in this realm. We have safe and supportive schools grant programs where districts can use a framework and self-assessment tool to identify what are the local urgent priorities and what steps um, are doable to take, and then how can um, those steps be assessed and measured um, and course um, adjustments made as needed along the way. We, um, I think we also believe it's very important to have districts learning from each other and taking on practices that are most helpful. So the Excel Network, Rennie, and others that are supporting um, networking and peer learning um, also um, something that, that we support and, and encourage. Um, and again, there are a number of other initiatives and ways we're interacting with districts to support the development of both social and academic learning um, throughout their work on how they Thank you very much. We'll, we'll get back there in just a second. <laughs> um, so Deb, back to you. Um, what are some of the strategies that you and your district colleagues have implemented to align with some of the learning that you all pulled from that analysis of your attendance data in terms of you identified something like you identified right away that some socio-emotional supports were needed. So what did you do next? So along the way we have developed them. And I've provided for you this evening our strategic framework. And if you turn to the back of that page, you'll see um, section 2.1, social emotional learning. We then took that particular strategic action plan and created a more developed action plan, which some of our key steps are to create a core SEL team at the district level and those at the building level. We're trying to create an vertically articulate what social emotional learning developmentally looks like pre K to 12, how a skill of independence for a preschooler can be um, identified, and how we would see that independence develop as these children go to be seniors in high school. We are also um, with some subcommittees working on developing for teachers a great level understanding of what it might look like to have a child who has the castle of competencies. And um, we're looking to integrate our work into the types of lessons and curriculum that are in the classroom. We are a very inclusive district. Uh, we try not to pull out students at every juncture. We push in whether it's our related service providers, whether it's our um, guidance counselors, we're trying to do the work in the classroom. We really try to prevent students from having what we would call a clicker experience, where they're going in and out and in and out of the classroom, and they're really missing out on the continuity of the instruction. And if you're already with challenges, I think that makes it that much harder. It also identifies you and calls you out to everybody. When our providers um, are in the classroom, they're working with all students and we're finding that to be social-emotionally social supportive to everyone. And at the same time, it's actually creating 
um, as Gower would say, that scopal teaching of working together in the moment and not um, requiring the step to go out to professional development, but rather to in vitro look at those students and work with each other and find new ways to service. So um, I have added one other thing on the back of the action plan, and um, it does describe obviously we adhere to the test. What we expect as a guidance to our teachers for social social uh sorry this part. Um so social skills or Define these things at each grade level. We hope that each student in our school has a school experience that leads them to gain some years of self and self confidence, resilience, leadership, <coughs> perspective taking, building relationships, and having empathy. Um, as we're pulling our um, SEL professionals together to guide the district in building this work, we have trained all of our administrators, and we eventually trained almost all, and we're still working on it, uh, our district staff in collaborative problem solving. We wanted them to have real tools to communicate and talk with children in effective ways and to be able to problem solve rather than just react. We have worked very, very hard on having zero restraints, zero suspensions. Um, we have built a a homeschool interventionist position and a home-based uh, home program, and so we're able to, if children have difficulties, provide for them in our school and not have them out of school, never missing any academic time. Um, and I can report that our numbers are pretty good. Our data um, shows that we're not restraining. We say we don't restrain, and we don't. We say we don't suspend, and don't, and then we're at less than one percent in those areas of um, having those more um, reactive or uh, punishing types of responses. We're really proactively trying to teach our children and look at their mistakes as, or their behaviors as ways that we have deficits that need to be uh, changed and to give them skills that they may not have otherwise been taught, or if they're taught, they might go to an implant to get a um, remedial specialized instruction in some of those areas where they're struggling social emotionally. So, um, the other thing um, that I did want to point out to you is that um, in our district, our students seem to be, it doesn't mean we don't have bullying or harassment or teasing or anything else like every other district, but we are finding that we're listening to our families and our children the moment they're coming forward. We really encourage them to come forward, even though they're listening, even if they will identify this bullying and it may not really be, but to come forward so that we can respond to issues very quickly rather than after they've really grown to be much bigger, major issues that are not as easily resolved. So those are the types of things that we're doing, the strategies that we put in place and the direction that we're going in. And before um, you all move away from that excellent handout that Deb put together for your for your review tonight, it, on the back bottom page, there's actually a, a sort of information about how Canton Public Schools has organized their RTI, or Response to Intervention, plan. Um, many of you are familiar with these notions of different tiers that organize instruction for different student skills and capabilities. Many times schools have both an academic and socio-emotional learning articulation of these. Canton does. So just to call your attention to how they sort of thought about how to address socio-emotional learning needs in the same way that academic learning needs would be organized across the three tiers just want to highlight that as sort of an excellent articulation of how to sort of again prioritize socio-emotional learning and blur that line between the academic and the socio-emotional. So 
Um, I'm going to move back to Richard um, and pose another question. Here we go. When do you think about the highest leverage strategies for districts to implement SEL? What comes to mind? And if you had to say, what do you think is the role for community in this work in supporting schools? Okay, so I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I wish I had brought hiccups. This is great. <laughs> sure um, also, my last response you said was very comprehensive. Does that mean I talk too long? Or does that mean I no, that's it. It's very comprehensive. Um, okay, so just a couple of thoughts. Um, I told this story actually last at our last Excel session. Uh, this summer I was in New Jersey and I, I, in a district and I was doing an observation and so I went into the classroom with my quarter column, whatever. And this teacher looked at me and said, oh, I wish you had turned yesterday because yesterday I was doing SEL. <laughs> and I thought, you know, okay. Um, but my point was, uh, my point here is that um, the, one of the biggest challenges I think that we face is that uh, educators, and this includes me and, and probably many of us in here, um, we still think of SEL as something separate um, from academics and everything else, when, when the actuality is uh, in everything that we do, it's in every interaction that we have, it's in our personal life, it's in our work life. Um, and so one of the highest leverage strategies that I've seen has been with districts who have said made a commitment to improve these SEL SE skills in all students and not try to um, fraction their efforts. One of the ways that they've done this, and I've seen this in some of the core districts as well as some other districts that we work with, uh, is that they didn't confine SEL to the pupil services department or the special ed department or uh, you know, some other department. Uh, instead, they ensured that the uh, groups collaborated, so most important, I, in my opinion, was getting any, anyone's department or office of instruction involved. Um, to me, to not have the department of instruction involved in all these other efforts doesn't really make a lot of sense if you're planning to help uh, improve these skills of every student. The other thing I'd say is, um, along with that comes what I what often refer to as intentionality. So, um, if you think about, I spent a lot of my work uh, studying school culture and citizenship and things like that. Um, and when we think about school culture, uh, we all know school culture is extremely hard to dictate, right? Um, and, and yet, every school has one. Every organization has one. The question I always ask is, are you intentional about what this culture looks like? Are you aware of what it looks like? And then are you trying to move it a certain way? Um, in a way that's best for kids. It's the same thing I, I feel like with uh, SEL. So the districts that I've seen be very intentional about it and send this message to the teachers who are obviously the resident experts in the classroom um, have had more success. Uh, but what I mean, and I, to give you like a concrete example, um, I, well, I'll just use my, my own self. So when I taught, I was a history teacher. I often did a seminar on the Vietnam War, I did a seminar on the Holocaust. When I think back to those days, uh, it was very easy in some of those cases, in those particular classes, to draw social perspective taking, empathy, uh, and other emotions and, and, and other uh, skills. But to me, if I if I garnered any kind of, uh, if I improved the students in, in those ways, it was sort of a bonus, right? If I went back to teach now, I would have been far more explicit about that, I would have reinforced it. And I would have thought about a way that I could maybe kind of get a sense of whether or not it was growing uh, in these students. Um, so that's what I think of when I think of that intentionality. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that, and I'll get to the community question, sorry. Um, but that SEL data, using data in a formative way, uh, has been another really high level strategy. Um, and in part because I think it gives schools a different, a real uh, look at what they're actually doing. When we think of SEL, often, I think, we, it's, it can be sort of floppy, so we think, well, you know, I think people have good relationships in our schools. Um, but that might not be the case, and particularly from a student's perspective. Um, but I'll just give one example. When I was in uh, Fresno, I sat down with an elementary no, sorry, middle school principal who was very excited to see the data because she, their school has been for the last three years very, very um, dedicated to a growth mindset. And so when she saw her, her 800 students or so reports, on their perspective, on their own growth mindset, which is extremely low, she had to revisit uh, the kinds of policies they had in place and the practices. So 
they were completely wrong about what they thought was going on, uh, which of course she was very happy to hear and to extend. Um, but it was also obviously very helpful. In terms of community, that's obviously a very tough one. Um, but you know, thinking a lot about care maps work and how we can engage families in a number of different areas, um, I would just say that one of the, some of the most successful examples I've seen have been when districts are openly sharing and being transparent about this data with parents. They're involving parents in the prioritization process. Um, and in the case of San Francisco, for example, the report card, parents now have a sense of what teachers are looking for in their students, and that has led to parent groups who are looking at the kinds of practices they're doing in the home and how those align with the school, and hopefully the uh, uh, various practitioners in the district will be listening to the parents as well. Um, but that's a really tough question. I mean, I, I think uh, we don't have a good answer for it, but um, there's a number of different examples. So in the interest of moving to uh, full audience Q&A for learning purposes so we can really sort of tap the expertise that we have in the room, I'm going to sort of ask for what, one more quick question. I'm actually going to go to Deb um, on this one, but then we'll be moving shortly to Q&A. So Deb, just to sort of close this out tonight, I know that the Canton Public Schools has a practice they are quite proud of, and that is the home visiting connection that you all have built. So um, maybe you could, I actually, we have a little guest star in our audience tonight, who's actually the coordinator of the program, who's, who's here, um, Kathy DeMazzi, who's going to talk a little bit about how they've used a uh, home visit program uh, and talk a little bit about how it's supporting their socio-emotional learning needs. Okay, then we're going to turn it over to Kathy. I was going to get out of it, <laughs> but I'm hoping you'll enjoy it. Good evening. My name is Catherine DeMassey. I'm a LICSW, a clinical social worker with the Camp Public Schools. And I guess I'm just going to keep talking, right? Okay. So I can only imagine the frustration of our kids sometimes when technology doesn't work. Um, so over the last three years, Ms. Um, Bromfield had basically asked me to play in the sand. She said, we want to develop a social emotional program within the Canton Public Schools. Help us do that. So one of the things that we decided on was to create the role of a homeschool interventionist. What does that mean? That is me going into homes, working with children and families in their homes, as well as working with them in the classroom. Um, it takes on a lot of different um, a lot of different ideas. So a couple things that we do as a homeschool interventionist, yes, we are clinical social workers, so we address basic needs. If we have families that need shelter, clothing, food, internet service, those sort of things, that's something I don't um, But those are the things that we, we immediately address. Other things are a family in crisis, loss of a family member, we're the first to respond. In Canton, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, we've actually lost a number of students. So the homeschool interventionist would go in, work with the family, help set things up, provide resources and support. Another big thing that we do is we help with mental health issues. So it was brought up tonight, we have, I consider a mental health crisis in the state of Massachusetts with the number of kids who are experiencing anxiety, depression, school refusal, school phobia. That's my job. So oftentimes, actually, when a child is absent five days in our school system, I'm put on alert. I then go into the schools. And basically, what I say to the families, because I know we all know about CRAs and probation officers and filing with the courts, is I say, I'm the last friendly face from the school to come in and assist you. And I have to tell you, I've never had a family say no. I sit with the family, sometimes it's in the evening, sometimes it's during the day. I treat out what the needs are of the family and the students, to figure out why it is that they're not coming to school, and then help them get those resources. A lot of times when we have children who are hospitalized with parent permission, I'll go into the hospitals and work with the students. We're able to then come out of the hospital with a really good plan, not just a checklist of those coping skills that they, you know, other folks think that we can use in our school. I'll basically say to the hospital, this is what we can do as a school. Help me figure out what the child needs. 
Um, attendance issues. So let me get back to that for a minute because school refusal is huge. We had a real big challenge. <laughs> so when I showed up in Canton, we had kids that were missing a number of days and really people couldn't figure out why. And sure, we file, you know, with the courts and things like that, but we really weren't helping families. And a lot of these students, it wasn't truancy, it was mental health issues. So what do I do besides going to the home? Um, I make recommendations. I'll help them access community places like Riverside that happens to be at the wayside up here. But I'll work with Riverside. I'll meet with them. Um, I'll help them do the crisis intervention piece. I'll hang in there and, and help them get stabilized as a family. And then what I'll do is figure out what can we do to get this child back into school and make things comfortable. So here's the really neat part. I was given the opportunity to create something that we call a home-based setting. Home base is used to transition children back from hospitals, to work with kids who might have school phobia or school refusal. We use that um, for students who might be um, really struggling with, again, anxiety, depression, suicide ideation. We keep these kids in our school in this setting. We also use it for students who might experience, have experienced trauma or grief. And the real neat part is that every child that comes in, we develop an individual plan. There's no cookie cutter method. And I'm well supported in this area. A couple of fascinating things that I have is I actually have, I actually have a robot. And I put the robot up into the classroom. And I'm able to live stream the actual class, the actual teacher, and students down to our home base setting. So the student then is actually getting educated, but what we're using this tool is, is to desensitize kids with the anxiety issue of getting them to gradually move from home to home base and then to the classroom. Once we feel as though they've been stabilized in home base, then I work to transition them into the classroom I'm working in the classroom as a push-in with other counselors, with teachers. So think about it. We're able to educate not only the teacher around that student, but other students in the class who might be suffering from those things. One last thing is we also have, we set up Google Classroom. Well, that's nothing new. But with our home base, I open it up to the teachers of the students who are in our home base. The neat part about this is if we hospitalize a child, I'm able to open up our group classroom to that child in the hospital. So that child in the hospital then is getting the social emotional support that they need. I'm going in on a periodic basis working with the team, and then they're also getting educated, and I and the teachers are able to view them through our Google classroom. So a couple of key things, and I know we've got 30 seconds, is that a big part of my job is really connecting families with what it is that they need, being the bridge to our school, wherever those childs are, helping the families address so their social emotional needs as well as the students. And the real neat part about it is you don't need a plan. You don't need a plan to get into our home base setting. You don't need an IEP, you don't need a 504, I happen to be the 504 for you too, but you don't need those things and you don't need those things to get the services from a home school interventionist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. So as a promise, we want to make sure to engage all of you in this conversation as well. So maybe we can take a few questions. Um, yes. I saw a hand behind you. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, hey. Thanks so much for hosting this and for everyone being here. I'm really excited and impressed. My name is Amanda Shepard from Birmingham, and I was really inspired about some of the work I'm hearing about the SEL development, specifically in California. I'm actually wearing an Oakland shirt right now, so uh, it's my adopted <laughs> home state. Um, specifically, what have educators and policymakers across the nation and, and in our local communities done to develop social emotional learning? through the use of Viola Spolin's theater games, or otherwise known as improv education in the classrooms. Viola Spolin revolutionized this work back in the 20s, and we've had all sorts of great things ever since. I'd like to hear comments about that, please. Thank you. Uh, 
it's a good question. I, I, I will say that uh, I have been to a couple schools. Where, uh, I don't know if this uh, follows this particular person that you cited exactly, but there have been definitely schools and districts that I've been to that use both air and the improv um, strategy for a number of facts. Um, have you, have, have, Many of you may have heard of the Breakthrough Back in School in Connecticut. Uh, they're focused exclusively on mindfulness. <clears throat> and some of the teachers there have uh, engaged in some of these kinds of strategies. Um, but they pop up from time to time. In terms of, from a sort of national policy perspective, I don't think it, as, as far as I know, it's not, you know, uh, on anyone's radar in terms of, like, a, you know, state effort or federal effort or anything like that. But that does pop up from time to time in the district. Yes. Uh, I guess you might. Hi. So um, I was struck, Richard, by your comment about um, when you specifically talked about, you know, examples of, of curriculum that we use and how to embed these skills into the curriculum. And I think, you know, hearing everything tonight, I think a lot of our districts are doing some wonderful things when our kids were identified. It's about being proactive and, and you know, explicitly teaching these skills. So I wonder from a state level if there's any discussion about looking at our state frameworks and embedding this somehow and making this be a priority with some accountability. Uh, Michelle, I think that one's for you. I think I'll, I think I'll check out. So um, there are a few things that, that, that I'll just briefly say. But um, one thing is that the department will be taking on revisions to our much outdated comprehensive health curriculum frameworks, which include social and emotional learning currently as a strand. Uh, and so we will be engaging with the field uh, over the next several years. We're, beginning, we're planning um, at this point the time and the process, the timing and the process. Uh, but that's one way. Uh, that we'll be taking this on. Another is that uh, we did add in our guiding principles in mathematics and English language arts and literacy revised curriculum frameworks recently, a guiding principle explicitly focused on uh, pointing to the effectiveness of integrating social and emotional learning into sort of broader math and ELA sort of content and standards. Uh, and we've also, in our revised guidelines on implementing social and emotional learning curriculum, added some examples that we'll elaborate on and, and uh, increase over time that, that specifically speak to ways that um, educators can integrate the development of social and emotional competencies into core curriculum. So those are just a few ways. Um, and, uh, and with other curriculum frameworks that we're revising, we're taking it on similarly. Great, thank you very much for that information. Another question? Thank you, I'm Joan Shaughnessy from Holliston. I have to ask, um, the Canton, um, what I heard you say is that you created this position, this at-home position. I get the model, I understand it. How on God's green earth did you pay for it? I'm the budget chair. <laughs> A blessing that I had from the school committee and the superintendents that I worked for, I lobbied hard and I started with one and that was Kathy and we now actually have one at every level um, and we continue to build our model. I said take a chance with the pilot and let me see if I can show you some results and as the results poured in, I think the dollars have continued to follow. So Deb, yeah, we're just going to ask you, um, who just walked into you with a mic, just, uh, folks in the back had a little trouble hearing. So just to recap, she started with one position, she now has three, but maybe you can see it, say a little bit more. Can I just dig in? I could probably clarify with a follow-up question. Please. So were these FTEs, were these recs that, again, I'm sorry, I'm a budget lady, um, were these FTEs that were already in the system that you, that you, were they social workers that were already employees of the system? These were, these were positions that were added to the Canton Public Schools. 
So I guess my question is more is what, for an administrator, I suppose, like, and where did where in the budget did you come up with that? So I, I've been through, like, I've been in this position for not a kid, but also as uh, for many many years, and I have learned how to be engineer, and I've learned how to be creative, and I've learned how to shovel, and I've learned how to ask, um, and so. Sometimes through ask, I got the position. Sometimes I actually um, re-engineered positions and got FTEs. But slowly and surely, I went from pilots. Whenever I have an idea, I tried to pilot it and show its worth and value, or ditch it quickly if it isn't working. And that's how I made that happen. I have, you know, used grant money at times to be a seed. Um, the 274 grant, which unfortunately isn't around right now. Um, at least for some districts, it is um, a mechanism that helps to bring a lot of professional development. That was a same thing to see go. Um, but it is hard because you have to pick and choose sometimes between what kinds of service and where you're going to be investing your money and where you're going to get the district to give you those empties or dollars. And, you know, sometimes it's just bringing back with a few kids or, you know, your average districts change or to be need grows and you have to build that program. So it's a little bit of everything, um, but I guess I would suggest for any district looking to do something like this, if you have a chance at least to try one, even part of one, uh, homeschool interventionist, that that might be a way to see, does that model work for you? Are you able to do some things? Um, I have this philosophy that 100% attendance, 100% of the time, and 100% engagement means that we have a chance of educating all children. And so I strive for that through this model of making sure that we have the children there and the only way we can get them there is that they feel safe and comfortable and are able to engage in their learning. So I've been using that as my sales pitch for many, many years. And I, as I said, at the very plus that I've had superintendents and school committees that have taken those risks with me and allowed us to do these things. And now they're helping me to grow these programs. Everyone, good evening. Gabby Abrams from the Midway Public Schools. Thanks to everyone for your commitment to this really, really important topic. A shout out to Richard, who we met last year during a um, Tri County Roundtable, Superintendent Roundtable meeting, and I was equally impressed with the work of transforming education at that time. I think that you are operationalizing something that's really hard to operationalize and we really need that in our work. So, um, and thanks to Canton for your for your exemplar because I think that we need to do a lot more sharing. So that goes to my question for Rochelle. I'm wondering if the, if the department um, has given some consideration to collecting some sort of systemic way to collect these models of practices throughout, um, throughout the Commonwealth. There's brilliant work happening in districts. And a lot of leaders in this work are spending a great deal of time kind of digging around for those models of practice because it's really hard to operationalize. Our educators, research says our educators need around 50 hours of professional development in order to shift their practice. And our leaders should be spending that time, that valuable time, developing their educators to do this meaningful work. And instead, we're kind of digging a lot. And I'm wondering if there are some structures that the department can help us with to really structure some um, some of these models that are existing, these best practices, without necessarily saying this is you know what we should be doing, but these are the these are the this is the work that's happening across the Commonwealth. So we can really benefit from the expertise of, of each other across the Commonwealth. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have um, a few things to say. One one is a great question and something we've been grappling with um, for years. And uh, don't you certainly haven't figured it all out. I think we um, appreciate, as I mentioned before, some sort of partnering entities that are helping to do that kind of work, um, like Transforming Ed and, and the Ready Center. We have, through some of our grant programs, um, made efforts to collect and continue to engage in the collection of some promising practices. Some of those can be shared on the website. So, for example, through our uh, wraparound zone initiative that was mentioned at the beginning of all we were participated in. Um, there's something called like, a cookbook that has recipes of some um, promising practices um, in that realm. We um, have another iteration of that wraparound zone work. We have a systems for student success office and some grants. Um, actually, Birmingham is 
is one of the grantees um, recently awarded and will be engaging in some of that work to be um, addressing barriers to learning coming up with um, systemic promising practices and then sharing that. But we have, we have other grant programs as well and, and our work with the State and Supportive Schools Commission um, is also aiming to increasingly provide examples of promising practice, um, again, with in-person networking as well as online. So the last thing I'll say is, so for example, is that um, one of our professional development sessions um, um, just uh, within the last few days, and um, we had districts um, with a case consultancy model sharing about some challenges and then hearing from peers about ways to address it um, in some presentations. So there, there's a number of different ways where we're trying to take that on, but we welcome brainstorming with you and others in terms of how we can do that better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Samar. I'm a school time coordinator in Framingham. My question is for the senator. You know, in the other school time arena, we see a lot of great products. One is code.org. They've taken programming with the best corporations, bringing their resources, and that's an awesome tool that we implement. What is being done at the state level to lobby, you know, resource our best universities, our brightest students, reach out to these corporations and ask them to integrate the SEL, help us bridge and expedite this great need. I'll just speak. I don't need a microphone. I've never been told I have a quiet voice. Um, you know, I think that it has to start early with, with our kids and building up and reinforcing. But, you know, somebody said to me today, so you're doing a SEL forum for kids in schools. When are you going to do one for adults? So I, I think that this is something that we as a society needs to put a priority on so that it will be integrated. It shouldn't be a separate curriculum in our schools. It should be integrated in all that we do so that our kids realize that this is a part of life. And then growing older as, as in going into the workforce, whether they be an employee or a manager or the employer, ultimately, that this should be a priority. All of the principles of, that we are hoping to teach our kids with social and emotional learning. And just think of what a better, it sounds corny, but think of what a better place this world would be. Is there a lobbying group? For adults, are you asking? For access corporations, like you think of what Facebook has done for code.org program, right? And all the different vendors that we use. If we say to them, we want you to incorporate SEL. Yeah, I mean, the Ready Center is, is working with uh, social and emotional learning, clearly putting a priority on it and helping to create the Excel Coalition. Uh, and, and there are a few other groups. Um, there's, if, uh, I know there's a Twitter, uh, Mass S M A S E L, that organizes and shares information. But it is a, a group that is growing, just like code.org. Uh, years ago, when I was pushing that schools should teach coding and computer science, people looked at me like, oh yeah, they know how to use the keyboard and stuff. Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, and I'm still pushing it. Uh, and, yeah, and I think that's something also that should be incorporated into every single school. And for the benefit of those in the school committee and, and the administration, I do believe the state needs to help fund some of this too, so it's not all on the districts. I'm Heidi Kaufman with the Metro West YMCA, and I'm curious about any models that might exist or ideas or suggestions experiences that people have had with um, working with community partners, so not just the families, but community organizations. There's several community organizations here in the room um, who provide either early learning programs or they provide more after school programs, summer camps, and things of that nature. What types of partnerships are doing, being done with those types of organizations um, who may have already invested or have program models that support social and Thank you. 
I think I can answer the one real quick. Yeah, too. Rochelle, do you want to take the lead and then I can follow? Um, you, you can come in quickly, I'll follow up on that. So, a number of ordinance uh, examples that we pointed to tonight, including Redding Public Schools, Fall River Public Schools, and <coughs> specific plans which have integrated the work of community based partners in providing socio emotional learning for youth in out of school time settings. Um, I would actually highlight the work of Boston After School and Beyond. It's an intermediary organization in Boston, Massachusetts that has integrated probably 135 community partners who are all working now on similar socio-emotional learning curricula and are using similar, if not the same, measurement tools to inventory student skills, uh, both through student self-report and teacher self-report based upon instruments that are socio-emotional learning instruments that have, that have been developed and led through a partnership between the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and um, socio-emotional learning researchers across the country. So uh, their work is probably comes to mind most in terms of the way community investment can continue to guide socio-emotional learning as a priority for our communities. They do it in summer learning, after school learning, um, and also work-based learning options to make sure that all of those community providers have a set of tools to work with youth on. It sounds like you're familiar with their work. Great. Rochelle, do you want to explain? No, that's great. That was, um, I'm happy you spoke to all of those. Um, I think the, the one other thing I'll, I'll mention um, is that we are um, looking into principles of effective practice re regarding integrated student supports. And part of that really um, has as its foundation schools engaging with community organizations and community partners so that students can be getting the supports that they need in school, out of school, and, and developing the skills um, you know, throughout, their develop, throughout their trajectory. Just getting back to the question you had asked, the, the organization that Senator Skolko was mentioning is the, the statewide advocacy group, is the Social Emotional Learning Alliance for Massachusetts. I'm the executive director. And it's SELRural4MA.org. Um, and it's free for anyone to join. Uh, we've got uh, people all around the Commonwealth who are advocating in their own communities and across the state for a high quality SEL in every community. The question that I wanted to ask was, uh, when you were mentioning that uh, Jennifer or Richard, you were talking about uh, Excel. Uh, can you say a little bit more about what the Excel network provides for communities that take part? Um, and I'm wondering that there are the nine communities currently taking part, and are you are there any plans to make it available to additional communities? Uh, sure, and Jen, <coughs> jump in whenever. Um, the first part of your question was uh, around, when you say community, do you mean the, you're talking about specific districts or the community surrounding those districts? Uh, or, the nine districts. Oh, the nine districts, okay. Uh, the, sorry, I forgot the first part of your question, but the second part of your question, I would say. What does it provide to those districts? What does it provide? The Excel network? Gotcha. So, in part, um, we launched this uh, based off, uh, in part based on this Carnegie model around a network improvement community. So the idea is right, that you bring in a number of different districts that focus on a similar aim. In this case, the aim really is to embed an uh, integrated SEL in every classroom to every single student. So we're looking at basically a three year process. We started with one year, um, and the first year is really all about planning. Um, the idea with the network, though, is that obviously individual districts have their own uh, needs that they need to address. Um, but the idea, particularly on the Carnegie, Carnegie model, is that you can leverage and actually work faster by learning uh, from successes, challenges, and other lessons learned from your fellow peers within that um, large network. Right? And so there's a lot more components to that, but essentially that's, that's one of the most powerful aspects of it. Um, Jen, go ahead and uh, jump in if you'd like this. So the notion here, uh, you covered the basics, planning for a year, peer-to-peer -peer support, 
the exploration of culture, climate, trauma, behavior, things that a lot of the districts who join us are bringing expertise on, and how do you sort of merge that and leverage it into SEL classroom integration? Years two and three would really, uh, should they be funded, focus on measurement techniques and how to sort of really kick that into high with some of the growth. Uh, I'm gonna call time on this discussion and ask if we can follow up later just so we can fit in one last question. Uh, and Pooja has the mic and she would be happy to sort of take one and then we're gonna close. Can we get two last questions? Your call. Hi, my name is Brian Prescott. I'm at uh, Hopkins High School. Um, I just want to thank you all for the conference. This has been very enlightening. And I had a question for Richard Pointer, and I want to follow up on what the senator was saying about kind of teaching adults about social and emotional learning. And I thought it was very interesting what you said about San Francisco having a social and emotional learning uh, report card. And I wasn't sure if you had any insight about helping teachers understand a standard for social emotional learning or you know what type of hurdles you faced or they faced in that district uh, coming up with a, a report card for you know SEL. Thank you very much. Uh, great no it's a great great question thank you. Um, so I'll I can refer to San Francisco but I'm going to talk in general with a lot, a lot of our partnerships. Uh, I've been working at TransferMed for about two years and when I first started I, within the, I was very focused on students, right, children. And by the second year, I realized, wait, actually, most of our work is with the adults. Um, in particular, when you start looking at the details of some of these competencies, and you look at the, uh, the uh, neuroscience behind them, and the education research behind them, the psychology behind it, you, can, you can't teach, it's hard to teach growth mindset or to help build that mindset if you yourself do not have a growth mindset, right? So I uh, often use this example, but when I was a history teacher, I, for years, I, by the way, thought that I was really bad at math. Just, I just felt I was naturally bad at math. And so um, I will be honest, I, I think I was a good teacher, but I probably passed on that notion to other students, and that's not good. And I, they probably carry that with them today. Um, so, I actually think a big part of this is uh, definitely with uh, knowledge building around adults. If I could choose anything in education to focus on uh, with this mission, I would, if I could, if I had my wish, I would actually reform every ed prep program around the country because I think that's actually where it was sort of lacking around the nation. Um, not in every university, of course, but in many of the programs. Um, and just quickly, I'll just say that the, these districts like San Francisco are aware of that, and so they're incorporating as much knowledge building as they possibly can. But as you know, that's tough, right? Because you need some buy-in for that, you need good facilitators, some good professional development for that. Uh, and it's just, it gets, it gets tricky. But I totally hear your point. It's um, very insightful because that's exactly one of the number one issues. And so knowledge building is huge. Um, I'm an adjunct at a local university, and when I, and I sometimes teach undergrads and when they are going to be teachers, and they're juniors usually, and I always ask them, what do you guys know about social emotional learning? What do you know about these skills? And often they say not, they know nothing. And it's not that particular college, it's all over the place. I see this at Harvard as well. So it's scary because these are folks that are going to become teachers. And so we've got to do a better job nationally um, in higher ed as well. So just to follow up with that one quick example of one of our districts, Nockhampton, that is part of the ACL network, uh, brought to us the notion that they were administering ACEs. So I'm not sure how many of you with that instrument, many nets in the head, but the notion that this instrument tracks uh, adverse child experiences, how many have you had, when did they occur, and how that might shape your own socio-emotional learning competence. It's a pretty common practice to administer to students in school, especially students who have been victims of trauma, who have behavioral health diagnoses, uh, who might have special ed diagnoses of a particular type. One of the districts, again, in the Excel network brought forth the notion that they are now doing this with their educators, right, to sort of have that same type of trauma, behavioral health, mental health, stressor, trigger, trauma conversation um, with their educators as a manner in which to really sort of model the kinds of more informed conversations 
They want to have about student socio-emotional learning, growth, health, and skill building opportunities as an outgrowth of the ability to have that conversation with their educator. So I think the notion here is very prevalent. It's the question of how do we do the work together. Um, and I told Pooja a minute ago that we could do one more question. So here we are, last question of the night. Quick question. Hi, I'm um, Mike Mary Mel from Public Schools. So my question is for Deb. I'm just wondering, with schools and districts really um, working to be very cautious about the amount of testing or evaluation we're doing yet, we want to have a good assessment of sort of students' skill deficits or strengths in SEL skills as well as to determine whether a school is in fact experiencing gains. I'm wondering what data points or assessments campus is using um, in terms of their role.
If you have more thoughts and ideas as to where we can provide more resources for you, please let my office know, let Pooja know, let Dennis know, he's here as well, or, or just call up and, and speak to somebody. We are here as a resource for you, so please let us know. Uh, we will start you know, thinking and looking into our next workshop, uh, but I just want to thank all of you for coming out. Again, thank the, the Framingham State and the Warren Center staff for being so terrific as well. I wish all of you a very happy, healthy 2018. Stay warm and dry. Spring will be here before we know it. Thank you.